We welcome you all to be part of our fifth webinar. Uh, and it's an absolute pleasure to have our friends across the border to come and join us for the session, Politics of Walking and Witnessing. I would like to now introduce in um, three different sections. First, of course, our project Pakistan Chalk Community Center and its, pro and its um, uh, new uh, project called Plus 921 Heritage Talks. I would then like to introduce the abstract of today's talk. And then I would like Aksar to introduce our panelists and then we will begin. That's the decorum. I would like also to request our guests to please uh, make sure that the mic and the video is switched off. And then by the end of our panel and the webinar, you can uh, ask us questions. You can even put them in the chat box. I can read them out. If, if not, you can raise your uh, hand on the emoticon and then we can let you come in and speak and discuss with us with this, with this, uh, with this session. So the Pakistan Chalk Community Center um, was established for the people to engage uh, with the pressing queries, especially with the arts and culture in Old Town. And we've had um, post COVID, we've, we've gone digital completely. And what we've started doing uh, is that we've started these really incredible two or three projects, which was um, our mapping project, which was a Sadak Chap, Ghair Sarkari Tarikh, which was our spoken history project where we were documenting and taking narratives from the, from the residents of Old Town. And then, of course, our ongoing project, which is every Sunday, our Heritage Walk Karachi, which does a lot of advocacy and, and uh, awareness programs uh, with, with the civil society, as well as with the children. We do a lot of like pro bono projects in public and private schools, teaching them the bylaws and heritage policies uh, so that they, we, we kind of make some kind of an outline and awareness for uh, on the grassroots level. Now, what is Plus 921 Heritage Talks? Plus 921 Heritage Talks is a project of Pakistan Chok Community Center, as I mentioned earlier, where we are going to host webinars every six months and uh, to discuss the politics of uh, preservation uh, in South Asia. Now, the dialogue on heritage is a global conversation which must take into account the local contexts. In a rapidly changing world, the dialogue around heritage preservation is shaped by many and relatively new factors. The parameters of what constitutes heritage are expanding and take into account not just the past and the tangible heritage sites, but our present as well as our current relationship with spaces we inhabit as communities. At PCC, we aim to engage in a comprehensive dialogue on the above questions by bringing together architects, researchers, urban planners, policy makers, designers, artists, journalists, filmmakers, bloggers, and activists to brainstorm ideas for the protection, dialogue, cons conservation, rehabilitation, and accessibility of heritage sites, and, and, and also thinking about public spaces in, um, uh, as a part of a project. Plus, 9 to 1 Heritage Talks hopes to bring all the stakeholders together under one multidisciplinary setting so that together they may present solutions, they may, may not, and these are feasible for, and they may be con uh, feasible for concerned authorities who are watching us. I would now like to introduce you today's webinar, which is on uh, politics of walking and witnessing. Now, walking is inherently a political act that places an individual in an active con conversation and engagement with their spatial surroundings. The idea of walking in a heritage zone the lived experience of witnessing the deterioration and decay of buildings while walking in and around them opens up a venue of experience that you cannot find in theoretical works or museums. It stimulates all our senses with sounds, smells, textures, and other physical qualities of heritage sites. The artifacts of heritage are no longer housed in, with, in white rooms or behind glass boxes, but they are experienced in highly activated living and breathing spaces, in narrow streets, in cramped up bazaars. Heritage Walks helps us connect with elements of heritage in a holistic way by expanding our understanding of what heritage means. One must then ask how Heritage Walks challenge the binary categories of what constitutes heritage and help us in looking for more local and grounded methods of heritage preservation. What new meanings do we give to these long forgotten heritage sites and their surrounding areas when we engage with them? 
And as the essay, Walking in the City, states that urban walking gives a new meaning to spaces and streets, which originally weren't assigned to them. The writer and the author of the uh, Walking in the City further um, elaborates and says that the terms walking as an act of resistance. In this sense, then one must ask how do heritage walks contest dominant and, and hegemonic historical or cultural narratives? Now, this is a very important part into our conversation today that we will be bringing and listening to uh, from our panelists from Hyderabad, from Chandigarh, and we are hoping that uh, our uh, uh, with panelists from Pindi will also be logging in soon. And we will share some of our uh, experiences from Karachi, uh, where Shaheen Numan and myself will share um, uh, our activism around Karachi and its, uh, and its nearby vicinities of the old town. I now give it to Aksa to introduce our panelists. So I will be introducing our panelists for tonight for our webinar on politics of walking. We have with us Yunus Lasanya from Hyderabad, India. Yunus is a, is a journalist with over 10 years of experience in reporting, who has worked with three national dailies in his career. He last worked as a state correspondent for Andhra Pradesh and Telangana with Mint HD Media. With a deep love for Hyderabad and its history, he also runs the Instagram page called uh, the Hyderabad History Project and is also the host of Beyond Char Minar, which is a podcast series on the history of Hyderabad, focusing on the lesser known aspects of his city and oral history. Yunus is the city editor of siasat.com. We have with us uh, Pamaljeet Singh, who is here to represent Chandigarh Architecture Walks. Uh, Pamaljeet Singh Sidhu is an architect and industrial designer who extensively interacts with, with the crowd to understand the relation amongst life, space, and object, believing that this engenders good design. In the past, he has also worked with Idea Square, CERN, Geneva on improving the well being of elderly in their homes. Currently, he is practicing contextual and cultural oriented architecture under his studio tub, where he continuously tries to find out more about the architecture style of United Punjab and what a possible future could be based on the needs of today. His passion for heritage also triggered the curiosity for, the, for understanding Chandigarh, the city which defined the very beginnings of modernism in architecture uh, in the South Asian region. It was from here that the idea of Chandigarh Architecture Walks emerged. Chandigarh Architecture Walk provides curated and in-depth walks of the city elaborating upon the history why and how was it designed and a detailed context positioning to the pre present scenario. We also have with us uh, Marvi Mazhar and Shaheen Noman who will be representing Heritage Walk Karachi. Heritage Walk Karachi uh, actively engages people from around the city with Old Town and other areas of historical significance. A, uh, Heritage Walk Karachi believes that the way to experience the milieu of vibrant living culture of Old Town Karachi is to walk through it. Thank you so much, Aksa. I really appreciate it. Um, I would now like to uh, um, invite Eunice to please share, and uh, and then we will, uh, right after Eunice, we'll hear Pamaljeet to share his work, and then we will uh, share our from our Karachi's perspective. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me for this panel discussion. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just to give a little bit of background and context for everybody here, uh, I've actually been a journalist for most of my career, uh, about 10 years plus. Uh, and about five years ago is when I began, uh, you know, started, I would say that five, six years ago is when I started looking into the city's history and started writing about it, you know, in detail and extensively. Uh, 2017 March is when I actually conducted my first heritage walk. And I'll be very honest and say that, you know, I was pretty much uh, somebody who was not really aware of the things in general. Uh, one of the main reasons I began, I got, I actually got into, uh, you know, conducting heritage walks and also writing, reading, and also in general, 
in engaging with hyderabad history was primarily because i realized while you know being a journalist or a reporter that most of the people in my city just like me were not really aware about most of the history uh so 2017 is when i began and after conducting heritage box i think i can say with you know with, with some kind of gumption that uh, there definitely needs to be a lot more work in you know when we talk about the city's history or it is like uh, i think i would say that abhi as of now uh things have gotten a lot worse you know like, like actually when, when you start walking in a city and start realizing the kind the, realizing you know how the, how how a city's landscape changes in even a short period of time uh you will realize how much there is need how much of work we have to do in general uh, so you know the best thing i can do is i can share a couple of images that i actually have i've clicked over the last 4 5 years in general while also conducting heritage walks and also while doing my own work so you know it, it I, my work began as a very uh, it's, a, it's actually very uh, ironic thing where about 5 6 years ago i so we have something called the indian national trust for uh, architecture culture and heritage intact they do a lot of uh, work in in conservation and preservation of uh, monuments and other things like that so they give out they give out they give out heritage awards every year and i think 5 years ago is when i realized that one of the monuments that they had given an award to was a, was the oldest church near my house which i never actually went to even though i actually passed by it all my life so i think that really it it actually upset me a lot because the you know, the realization that something that existed for so long and i never really knew about it that is where it actually began then uh, that's where i actually began putting in a little bit of more work in general to understanding my own city and uh, i'll give a bit of a little bit of context about hyderabad before i get to the pictures also see hyderabad is 431 years old it was founded in the year 40, 1591 by somebody called mohammad kuli qutub shah mohammad kuli qutub shah's grandfather was an iranian who came to india to the deccan i'll i'll show you in a bit around 1470s or 80s and uh, he eventually goes on to become a king in 1518 so before hyderabad was built there was something called the, there is something called the golconda fort the golconda fort was a walled city before hyderabad was built and in 1591 is when mohammad kuli qutub shah decided to move out of the fort and we still have basically we actually have the forts boundary walls and the gates and a lot of smaller buildings inside and i think that's the best example with images that i can show you as to how uh how much we've actually lost in the last 20 30 years due to urbanization and what we call quote unquote you know development of a lot easier for me to also explain what i what i'd like to talk about so this is something that i uh, have made very you know specifically it has a lot of images i won't be able to go through everything so i'll just you know whatever is important and relevant so uh this is the first thing that a lot of us see when we enter the golconda fort so this is so before hyderabad was built is what this whole thing is as, as a as a very big citadel and in case you know you may have heard may not have heard the golconda city or the golconda kingdom in 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 the subcontinent history and global history was very well known for its diamond trading so i'm talking about you know the 16th and 17th century so the golconda fort was very famous for diamonds and also for something of called uh, wood steel wood steel is something that's required to make damascus steel so golconda and another part in south india were very much actually in demand for wood steel and for diamonds but anyway uh, so this is the entrance way to the main fort and if you see close you can see that there's actually a bit of persian and indian mythological architecture designs on the on the door of, of see uh here it's just, it's not yeah so this is supposed to be what we call a shirdal a shirdal is supposed to be a cross and a lion sorry a bit a cross between a lion and an eagle in uh, persian in iranian mythology unfortunately or uh, you know i think the designs have been a little bit damaged and stuff you know over the past over many many decades but uh, it's actually a one of the few places in the entire city where we have something like this even you know in full form uh uske niche yahan par what you see is something called uh, yali yali some indian mythology again so this is a very basic core element of hyderabad's uh, original architecture as i would call it because uh, the city was also destroyed in the year 1687 so we we don't actually know how hyderabad used to look originally 
what we know is what was built in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century all of our major monuments so moving on so this is actually a good example of one of the darwazas of the golconda fort so if you if you look so this is something that i discovered you know after like reading books and trying to figure out golconda fort kitna bada hai eventually i found out that the fort has uh, 87 bastions had sorry had 87 bastions and uh, it has eight gates and it has it's supposed to have i think hundreds of smaller structures inside so you can see that this is one of the gates called fateh fateh uh, means uh, victory so this is the door from which the mughals actually entered the golconda fort and took over the kingdom so this is the door that actually goes to the main fort yaha upar if you can see thoda sa where where i'm pointing at all of these buildings in between are actually uh, encroachments inside so between the main fort and between the gates literally everything has been encroached and all of this happened in the last 30 years and technically speaking this is supposed to be under uh, the archaeological survey of india uh, but you know that this is this is i think this is where the politics of walking comes into the picture because a lot of it is also political resettlement and this is not something that's very specific to hyderabad or the golconda fort in general but it happens everywhere from what i've seen in india across you know uh it comes with a, it happens with a small it ha- it happens with a small building somewhere and then you know it happens with a small small settlement and then that small becomes a little more little more little more and you know by in a couple of years you realize that pretty much everything has been gone so very ironically the only thing that the asi actually controls is this part on top everything everything else is basically left open for anyone to do anything uh even the gates are actually not in a good condition uh let me go forward this is this is basically how darwazas look uh i think one of the doors fell down some years ago from in one, in one of the gates unfortunately nothing much could be done they had to just pick it up and just take it away so that's how this is the map of the fort uh, luckily this is what i was able to get also uh, if you notice this fort is roughly about 6.8 km in circumference if you, if you notice here there is also supposed to be a moat here uh, you know how it's a, it's a typical medieval fort so you have water you are supposed to have like a big boundary so this is supposed to be a, a this is supposed to be a fort which has an extension on top all of this in between is gone so the only things left are the boundary walls and point number 1 that's it baki pura andar ka sab chale gaya so we don't even know what used to be there is only like small small tiny tiny buildings left people have built homes uh, so so this is so people have built homes everywhere on the boundary walls and things like that uh, this is this is actually very interesting part of the fort you have a baobab tree that was planted by traveling africans in the 1600s we don't know exactly what date but this is actually a massive uh, tree roughly about 25 meters in circumference so it's called hatiyon ka jhad in uh, by 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 locals the uh, apparently these are trees where elephants would also go to get water so that's why it's all some people say it's it's called hatiyon ka jhad because the trunks resemble look like you know elephant trunks i'm not sure what is the way the word word comes from anyway moving on uh, so this is actually a very good view of the entire fort that you get from 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 so to the highest point is called bala hisar which translates to high point uh, from bala hisar when you go pura upar on the darbar hall you can see this is the main palace area of the fort and the entire thing all of the houses that you see here this entire patch all the so you you can see like there's like a whole bunch of encroachments and homes that were built by locals and then piche you see yahan par it's all again green because parts of the fort are with the army so those are actually parts of it that have been kind of maintained uh, and this is i guess one of the best examples i can give of you know local and i i, I don't think anything much can happen here in terms of what we can save because i from whatever i've traveled in india also there are actually forts in india which have been encroached so badly that people live inside the fort itself and i don't think any is it's possible to you know clear those those kind of places today at all so this is what is inside the golconda fort but as you go forward out you know outside the city, so this is by the way part of the moat that still exists uh yahan par you can see that because people have not been able to you know take over this part there's still some part of the so we actually come here for a heritage walk sometimes uh luckily because it's not been completely encroached upon we can actually walk around the whole boundary but otherwise i ideally speaking this would have been a very uh, important place for any government to do something about this but you know it's it's a, it's a, it's a very sad thing because piche pura kachra pada hua hai so like, like literally there is trash 
we have to walk between trash and then come to you know come to see this place that's how bad it is sadly uh this is the charminar this is actually the first monument built in the entire city the charminar literally you know charminar uh was built in 1590 91 ke beech mein this is actually uh you know one of the most crowded places right now very interestingly about 5 years ago the government pedestrianized this place uh i don't have very recent photos because uh, un- unfortunately thode ghum gaye but until about 5 years ago all the vehicles would just be passing you know literally side se i, I think about 15 20 saal pehle tak also you actually had vehicles passing by even from between the fence did not come a very long long ago it actually uh, came up i think around 2005 6 ke baad hi and you would have, you would actually expect the government or whatever to you know pedestrianize an area like this but it took a while now very interestingly this is from covid so because it's it's, it's pretty khali so you can see there's nothing around but uh, one of the this is this is a place which is very important and at the same time is also the most overlooked area in the entire city in terms of heritage and history uh i don't do walks here in the evening because it is almost impossible to uh, walk in this area after like noon and even almost impossible uh, yeah this entire area is so crowded that the, so the 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 problem in such in such a space is not even the uh, visitors or tourists it's actually the hawkers so this is actually one of the uh, most crowded areas in terms of hawkers and the hawkers have actually occupied the entire area so much that there's barely any place for for, for pedestrians to walk and there's again you know a lot of uh, it's again local politics and then you have uh, it it it's a little weird nobody that that nobody has actually been able to do anything about something like this it, it, so i'm i'm talking from and i am talking from a very uh, tourist perspective also it's it kind of it's it's it, it's really bad you know talk it's really really bad like beyond a point in general when you let's say if you want to go and just take a look at the monument or the place early in the morning subah 5 6 baje se there is so many there are so many people there it's not it's it's really it, this is this could this should have actually been one of the most beautiful places in the entire city to walk around because the monument is actually one of the most important things architecturally so this is a mosque on the second floor uh, i think a couple of decades ago people somebody committed suicide to upar ka second floor ban kar diye we can't go there today this is how the city looks from uh, from the charminar this is one of the oldest structures in the entire city it's called this is part of something what we call the char kamand these arches were once the entrances to the new city of hyderabad this is how it looks so you know you can see all of these shops here all these stalls here uh, this is actually by the way uh, morning before the entire market wakes up okay it's not actually even it's it's not even remotely crowded as i would say so this is this is this this is this is literally what you would see if you go to the old city you go to the charminar this is what you see and apart from that see oh this is the the other important thing that i have here is this something called the badshahi ashur khana which is the second oldest structure built in hyderabad in 1591 92 ke beech mein the qutub shahi kings who founded hyderabad were uh, shia muslims and i quote unquote books they were orthodox shia muslims so the second and the most important second most important building that we have is a is a muharram shrine basically this monument was originally built with mosaic tiles most of the tiles have been damaged due to floods and other things but in some parts the floods so in some parts the tiles are still here believe it or not most of the people who come to hyderabad even for tourist reasons or just for visiting don't know about this place so the badshah shurkhana which should ideally be on you know the heritage list for pretty much everybody or even for any tourist or anybody who has remote interest in history is not there so i make it a point you know to come to this place we actually sometimes begin the walk from here and i think 95% of the uh, times people don't know about this place uh, this is actually the nakarkhana where they would play the periodical music for uh, uh during the time of mohammad quli qutub shah and this is kind of if you if you notice here there's like a lot of greenery like sorry kya bolte hai there's a, this literal tree inside that is grown uh and i don't think this is something that can be salvaged very easily iske piche there's a there's a lot of encroachment around the compound in fact this place was also encroached by a lot of hawkers which had to be cleared and all that you know a typical example of uh something that was almost lost to encroachment and then again finally you know somehow the people there got and they saved it uh so the walk actually from that i have in the old city is from the ashur khana till the charminar 
and it's again we do it only in the morning we don't actually do in the evenings because it's nearly impossible to walk and pretty much yeah uh, we have like a whole bunch of other monuments so okay so just to give you a small bit small bit of uh, idea a little bit of idea about what work that has been done so this is where this is these are called the qutub shahi tombs the qutub shahi tombs there is where i think is one of the largest necropolises in india it's where all the founding kings are king where all the founding dynasties all the founding kings queens and the founding dynasty is buried it has nearly 100 structures it's been redone very beautifully also restored sorry the restored is the right word so it was all uh, all the monuments had a lot of uh, had different kinds of issues one of the issues that we also uh, saw was that a lot of cement was used on these structures which which are made of limestone so during the restoration they actually had to remove all of the cement and then you know redo a lot of the broken designs here and there so it's today it's one of the most beautiful places in the entire city for anyone to walk in or explore the city i think the qutub shahi tomb is a fabulous place uh, hopefully you know if, if any of you come down to india at some point you should definitely see place so yeah uh, this is you know part of the heritage walk that we have this is this is the found this is the founding kings tomb mohammad quli qutub shah tomb mohammad quli qutub shah tomb is actually very interesting tomb that we have uh, because if you it's actually fusion of what we call indo persian designs you'll find a bit of elements from the local architecture including from temples especially floral designs from temples that have been incorporated here yahan know, upar se so it's one of it's is the largest tomb there but not the most interesting because some some parts or some of the tombs you actually have persian tiles but all the tiles are again damaged so this is again a typical example of a monument uh, you know getting damaged uh for a lot for a lot of different reasons i think for lack of uh, well lack of maintenance is i would say one of the, the the most major things that you see but other otherwise uh just fyi one small thing if you look at this image here this is an image of a pineapple on the charminar so pineapples so what we what i generally focus on uh, on my at my walks especially for people who love uh, connecting history this are uh, designs like these pineapples Uh, you'll find pineapples pretty much everywhere in the deccan especially from the 16th and 17th centuries because pineapples uh, were brought to hyderabad and to other parts of the deccan by by the portuguese via trade we were actually de dealing with the portuguese uh, i think 15% of all imports into portugal in the 16th 17th centuries were, were very specifically from one of the ports that were under the golconda kings pineapples were a symbol were basically a symbol of hospitality and also wealth so that's why you will find pineapples in the most important monument that we have in hyderabad uh but yeah again so you'll find pineapples even in the tombs of royalty here so moving on so yeah uh this is actually one of the uh the most more recently restored buildings also again this is the british residency this was built in around between 1790 to 1804 this is actually uh, in a in a pretty bad state when uh work had begun now is this is a, this one of the gates of the british residency It's called the Empress Gate. Uh, the residency is also one of the, uh, I would say, architecturally speaking, one of the most important monuments in the entire city. This is the staircase. Uh, it's all been redone, so this is how it used to look earlier, and now it's like a completely different place that we, when we go. Otherwise, yeah, uh, this is the church I was talking about. If you if you may, remember that, you know, one of the churches that got an award for uh, its historical importance. So this is the Saint John's Church. St John's Church was built in 1813 by the British. This was the first major British monument in Secunderabad that was a cantonment founded uh, in 1806. So this this church is, of course, you can say like any other church in South India, but this is what makes the church very important. It's actually a pipe organ that was built, I think, around 1908 or 1909. Very interestingly, by uh, it was installed by a Muslim man there. so these are the kind of things you know that we uh, explore when we conduct heritage works we actually talk about how uh, how these things so and I, i believe the st john's church is the only place in the entire city that has a functional pipe organ you find pipe organs i'm pretty sure uh, very commonly in the uk where they still use but in hyderabad i think this is the only church where a pipe organ is still used today but yeah i uh, this is most of what we do the idea is to show people how our city is history you know how hyderabad has a continuous history starting from the 15 early 1500s all the way to today uh we try to give a uh, generally i take maps i show them where we are where we walked i try to connect 
to connect them to not like for a lot of the people who've come who come to the walks are also youngsters or people who are i think around 40 50 year old people who've lived there lived in areas their whole lives but have not really seen anything you know if, if you know what i mean you pass by something your whole life and then you suddenly want to realize oh ye to main pehle like mera roz ka hai but i never kind of you know went in and saw this place so that kind of stuff and i think that is what is really need to engage what is what we really need to engage people in history because if you don't have a connection to your city you basically end up you know not really caring so in hyderabad we have a lot of irani cafes i pretty much make sure that any time and every time we do a walk i try to end it at an irani cafe or at least we start an irani cafe with chai i i am a like a proper pakka chai drinker so i explain irani irani chai history from where these iranians have come why they've come here and things like that uh don't think i actually have a photo of an irani cafe but if i do i'll just share it across anyway but yeah pretty much uh, that's about it this is so modern hyderabad by the way was uh, uh began to be built after 1911 after 1911 1912 when we had a massive flood in 19 not it the entire city was destroyed so the high court for example was built around 1919 uh and then we also have this by the way the theosophical society was i believe started in 1875 by uh, mr by by miss blavatsky so this is a, they actually have international lodges the oldest lodge of the theosophical society is actually in south india and tamil nadu but we have one from 1905 very interesting place where ancient uh, where they actually study east and west eastern and western philosophies not sure uh, or kahan kahan hai but uh, i believe i'm currently in bombay bombay also has a blavatsky or a, or, a, or a hall here also so uh, that's that's uh, yeah or oh yeah so the other thing that we do also i try to connect Our heritage walks to food. This is an Anand place that that goes back to eighteen fifty one or eighteen fifty seven. I think it's eighteen fifty one. So Munshi Anand has been there from over one and a half centuries. And the thing is that they stop. They don't actually make Anand in machines anymore, like at all. Like they still use their hands. So what they do is they actually have a small tandoor here. With tandoor, they just still make the Anand. It it makes a very big difference. uh because people can actually see the process they don't they even have their own recipe for their naan you know in terms of uh, uh their uh, what do you call the dough i i actually sat down with an interview with this he is the owner so it's his i think his great 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 grandfather who actually went to delhi found a recipe for naan came back to hyderabad uh, and then began the shop so the shop has been exist has been there from the 18 1850s um so yeah this is a by the way this is a typically that you know we will have to kind of like wrap up for the next yeah, time so that, that's about it so pretty much i'm done uh, but that's yeah i hope you got an idea of the city thank you thank you uh much appreciated uh hasan uh, thanks for joining in i mean um you know uh, missed out you on the on the beginning of the conversation when we were introducing yes um uh, could we request you to to dis- to share your uh, perspective on our abstract uh sure sure um i would also like to share my screen i have a few that i'd like to show uh, i just want to give a quick uh, uh, again a, a little short background of hasan he is uh, a, an architecture student and culture and architectural historian he's also uh, the founder of pindi heritage projects and tours and he does uh, these incredible uh, walks in 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 the town of pindi so we would like to hear from you then hasan thank you for joining in yes just uh, i may need to open the file um or uh, okay. uh, i think i will just take it away uh, hasan can you check your in- internet a little bit your internet can you just check that you you are lagging oh okay. maybe we can ask pamal ji to start and then we will come back to you hello ji ji let's uh, thank you pamaljeet for waiting patiently no no request you yeah okay thank so you. just give me a minute i'll share my screen so as uh, she gave a quite long introduction so i'm an architect and later i studied industrial design and then followed by a small course in innovation design so the interesting part is uh, all three cities where i studied were like architecturally very rich like jaipur one of the first design cities which was done in 1728 then amdavad which is a un un heritage listed city and then uh, farara is a small town in italy which is again a un cultural heritage listed city so i was lucky enough to study in the cities which are architecturally rich 
coming following back coming back to india uh, i started with a design studio called tub uh, with my partner srishti and tub is basically a design consultancy where we do we try to do culture responsive design what you call because what's happening in right now in punjab is ki wo sab kuch in the name of modernism or in the name of trends or in the name of other, like just for sake of doing so people are just making match boxes kind of a thing so we are just trying to step back understand the needs and understand the ruler needs like a lot of still a population in punjab are agri so they are based on agriculture and they have good money they spend good money on residences and so we are just trying to bring look with their needs and do the but the best we can and on the parallelly we started this chandigarh architecture walks so this was uh, started out of passion initially uh, to be just to give you a context so the first image that you see this is a high court building and then you see a young girl so this was a student from taiwan so i was just visiting the capital complex where you have a high court building by lee corbusier and a palace of assembly and there was a group of students from taiwan and so the local guide who they took like as a guide they took he was giving very shallow details of what the architecture was or the, what the context was and i just casually stepped in and added few details and eventually after 5 minutes it was me who was giving them to her and that was not planned a thing and and but i really enjoyed that after that what i started doing that so the next image that you see so both of them are my cousins so i used to grab my friends my cousins are chalo shehar dikhane dekhne jaate hain na i'll kuch kuch naya dikhata hu and so this is like a residence pair john resley ko buddhist cousin who stayed in this residence for 16 years so that was later now it's been transferred uh, transferred into a museum but at that time it was just a residence jaise khali pada hua tha so i used to aise koi bhi mere dost aa rahe hain chandigarh are main dikhata hu chandigarh and this went for almost 2 years on and off na and then uh, during covid we made a small wordpress website like chandigarh architecture walks and it was purely passion project and uh, then we had these two architects the one image on the extreme right so one is shimul zaveri and her husband rahul kadri so they are like one of the top architects of india based in mumbai they do all the taj or boys hotels and all and we just got a call from them and Honestly, we said कि हम तो ऐसे मजे में कर रहे थे ना दोस्तों के साथ और ऐसा कुछ मतलब हमारे पास ऐसे कुछ डेटा बेस जितना है वो नॉलेज है बट ऐसा कुछ नहीं है तो एंड देवर वेरी हम्बल एंड शिमूल सेट की पमल तुम हमारे साथ ट्राई कर लो एंड आई वॉज लाइक की बट यू आर इट्स इट्स टू बिग ऑफ ए शॉर्ट टू ट्राई विद यू एंड देवर कमिंग इन ग्रुप ऑफ फोर्टीन एंड अदर पीपल वर लाइक टॉप टू फेमस आर्टिस्ट वन बिग फैशन डिजाइनर like the south bombay crowd you see na sunil shethi sister and tarun telani so and it was like the biggest <laughs> a group that could be but rahul kadri so rahul kadri's father is i am kadri who was like one of the biggest architects in india so rahul said that you still have 10 days give a shot prepare curate and eventually tumne website banayi hai to karoge to bhi kar lo and so we did a very honest shot and it went very well and we got very well paid also so then we thought okay this could be a potential like business also in frankly the it's so people are even happy paying for this na no? just to going around the city so then we started curating we bought good amount of books when i say good amount of books i think we have almost every book on chandigarh no we don't have the latest ones but especially all the ones which were written like in 60s or 70s or 80s we bought scanned from different libraries we studied we went to this different corners of the city on foot and curated walk so now what chandigarh architecture walks is that uh, so i want to make a point very clear so in contrast to hyderabad walks so there are more of so there are a lot of stories and history to it chandigarh is a very modern so so the history is not just 70 years old now the, the chandigarh started designing in 51 the proposed brief was made in 40, 1949 so it's more of a modern heritage but what our walks are more of 
lecture focused so um, our major clients or the people our guests are architects or people who are like have a good interest in architecture and that too then eventually we realized that there are a lot of swiss and people from france who are coming especially to chandigarh and then we started curating tours in depth like because the whole narrative of the city is just le corbusier city like le corbusier city but a city is a lot more than that so we'll just come to that so uh, next so this is like one of the brochure the one of the images like a screenshot of one of the brochures that we do so this is like we have a walk called making of chandigarh in which we discuss like how the city has been built so it was not corbusier who was the first choice like it was like and mayer came to india they stayed here for a month so the, the long story while returning back noviki died in a plane crash and so then they have to find the new team of architects and then they went to europe and so and then it's it, corbusier was idly a architectural advisor so there were other three architects like jane drew maxwell fry to those two were britishers and then pray johnre who was a uh, corbusier's cousin so those three were the architects who you will be who was supposed to stay in india for 3 years and corbusier will be visiting twice a year for one month each and later uh, uh, perry john ray stayed here for 16 years like he stayed till his death and he is the one who made the city it's like it's not corbusier uh, came and go and and then john uh, maxwell try and jane drew did maxim a lot of housing school cinemas because a uh, city can't be made in few years now so it like even it was like a freshly designed city it took almost 24 to 25 years for it to start getting filled matlab woh shehar jaisa lagna shuru hua 70s mein late 70s mein jabki like jo high court building tha wo 1955 mein shuru ho gaya tha so it almost 20 years lage usko shehar ko aise bharne mein aur us 20 years mein there was a team of indian architects who initially worked under the team so there was they used to call this the team capital pure project ko the project was project capital and the team of architects was team capital and they the aim was ki 3 saal hum bahar se architects ko layenge hum indian architects ko train karenge bahar wale architects chale jayenge indian architects uske paas they will continue the whole thing but eventually what happened john ray stayed till his death and i mean 1965 john ray was not keeping well he went back died and he was so attached to the city that his ashes came back to chandigarh and it's now in the sukhna lake so in the walk we all try to give a, everybody a context that what you are witnessing is something which is done 70 years back one two it is done by a country which just got independent three on a very short budget and four the very important it is a capital of a state so it was the capital of a state punjab it was not a national level city and so other as we were discussing so it was not only le corbusier so this is one of the most famous images what you see when you ever type chandigarh so a open hand monument or the assembly or the high court building undoubtedly they are the finest pieces of architecture in terms of modern architecture and they define what modernism in south asian content but they were not only other architects but there were situations like in 1966 punjab redivided into punjab haryana himachal three states and then there were a lot of important people who were either bureaucrats or people who were in the politi- politics who took a firm stand and who developed the city the way it is today so just to give you an example like jawaharlal nehru made a very clear point that we will make a city which shows our faith in freedom which shows our faith in future so we don't want anything which should connect to the past or any links so these uh, things give a very broad context to when somebody with who is walking with us is witnessing the city and uh, this was another important point so before uh, before we started architecture walks there were few other guides also who are in chandigarh and who are doing walk but what the trend here is that you get in a car you hop to one location maybe a museum suppose then you go back in a car you hop to another location hop to another so that's how it is done and 
a lot of tourists and a lot of people. So that's the same loop the people are doing. But we made a point to do walking tours. Uh, and so when I say walking tours, our tours are generally the minimum is three kilometer walk and in which takes all, almost two to three hours. And the longest is like a six kilometer walk, which take almost a half day in which in between we break for snacks and all. So, so right now I'll be showing some images from the walks, which are the buildings not of Corbusier and which are more of a hidden gems or covering different parts of the city. So like the one here is a building, with, it's a cinema. It's in the city center, which is one of the most important urban designs of the Corbusier. So other than the three main buildings, Corbusier also did design the detailed out the city center, which is like, which was supposedly the center business district. But right now, as the city have changed, there are many new small towns which have come up around the Chandigarh. So the center has been shifted. So this cinema is done by an Indian architect called Aditya Prakash, and he was one of the finest from the Indian lot for the from the Indian group, and he also was the principal of Chandigarh College of Architecture for the longest time. And so then this is the works of John Ray. So John Ray's work, he did a lot of work in housing because Chandigarh was a, it's still an administrative city. So being an administrative city. There are a lot of people who are working for the government. So Chandigarh has 30% housing as a government housing. So still the system is that you get a house from the government until you retire, you live in that. And once you retire, you get it and somebody else come and lives with that. So they designed like 13 type of houses, house type one for the CM and then for the judges, for the ministers, for the IAS and bureaucrats, accountants, clerks coming down to the sweepers and then later Jane added house type 14 because she figured out that there's still people like people who are doing laundry or people who are sweeping the streets are missing so then now we have 14 type of houses then it was also important point to note that in 1949 when they were writing brief for different house types they made a point that the poorest of poor will have proper sanitation in the house so the, even this house type 14 is two rooms, one kitchen, two courtyards, front and rear, and a washroom. And which is still not the case in all the villages. We don't have proper sanitation in the house and running water in the house. So the one on the left, there are two images. The one on the left is house type 4. And the one, it's an interior a living area of a house type 4. And the one on the right is house type 13. So... So the size and the palette, everything changed in, in terms of budget. But we also have to note that the whole budget was, it was a very low budget project. Like, so the major material being used is bricks. And so just to give you an, a context, one square foot of a brick wall in versus one square foot of glass or a window was seven times expensive. And exposed concrete was four times expensive. So all the windows were narrow, small. The openings were small. And other thing why the openings were small, because in those times, all the activities were done outside. Khana bahar khana, raat ko chhat pe sona hai, bartan bahar dhone hai, kapde bahar dhone hai, everything, especially in the house type, like seven, eight, nine, ten, for the people like that, the whole, all the chores were done outside. So you have big courtyards in front and back. And the house is more of a storeroom or just to sleep in winters. On the contrast, the people, the house type two, three, four, five, six, seven. So they have proper servant areas in them, and they have like all the all the amenities of a modern living with them because it was speculated that these people will like adopt the Western lifestyle or adopt the modern lifestyle more quickly. Uh, then we have schools like. The schools are one of the most interesting thing in Chandigarh. Uh, almost every, so Chandigarh has 53 sectors and almost every sector has one primary school, a nursery school and one higher secondary school Then three post-secondary. Uh, these three architects, later the architects from the Indian team, they experimented a lot with the school. So the one in the image that you see is a pre-nursery school, which is done by John Ray. And the scale is very, like, it's a, a child scale school. The, the roof is low, the steps are small. And also while we are walking, we, you see the way now it's painted. 
तो अभी टाइम के साथ हाउ इट्स चेंजिंग मतलब एक्चुअली पूरा वाइट था फिर अभी यू यू कैन सी अ प्रोजेक्टर आल्सो इन द इमेज पीछे एक प्रोजेक्टर का वो वाइट लगा हुआ है सो सेम बिल्डिंग इज अडेप्टिंग नाउ सो ऑल द स्कूल्स आर लाइक स्मार्ट स्कूल्स विद प्रोजेक्टर एंड आल्सो हाउ दे आर अडेप्टिंग हाउ पहले पुराना स्कूल फिर उसको पेंट करके एक अलग लुक दिया एंड देन नाउ विद ऑल द टेक्नोलॉजीज इट्स बीइंग अडॉप्टेड सो ऑन द सो दीस आर लाइक द बिल्डिंग्स बाय द वन बाय जेन ड्रू अनदर बाय मैक्सवेल फ्राय सो दे आर मोर ऑफ हिडन जेम्स दे आर नॉट पॉपुलर नॉट डॉक्यूमेंटेड मच बट वे लाइक टाइम्स अहेड फ्रॉम द व्हेन दे वर बिल्ट सिमिलरली दिस इज बाय एस डी शर्मा अनदर इंडियन आर्किटेक्ट एंड other than architecture there there initially there were some experiments with the plantation with the landscaping also which which is like so it was more of a so nehru's vision and he very pointed out that this will be a city where the young architects will learn so they have a lot of experimentation so a lot of small small prototypes of things which have not been used later and now how the city is being used now like so this open hand monument and this podium was supposed to be like a dais to talk and now it's like the one of the photographic instagramable spots and so and this is like uh, the one where you see the scooter so this is was supposed to be a veranda where people wait but now you have a lot of notary like how the city eventually people adapt <laughs> so that's it so thank you so same, much thank you this was a lovely uh, uh, walk through with you i mean really really enjoyed it thank you so much thank you may i request uh, hasan if you would like to share yes yeah. yes yeah. let's do it lovely um so i will give an int- a small introduction to myself um uh, my name is hasan uh, i think you mentioned earlier i'm an architecture student um and i've been doing research on pindi um under a project that's called the pindi heritage project uh which has been going on for over 5 years um this research on pindi started as um architectural research about the city uh, which is something that uh, i was always fascinated by uh was uh, sort of this built history all around me um but this research uh, sort of quickly turned into this cultural research about the city also uh since if i give you uh um uh, a small little historical background to the city it's that before uh the partition the city used to be a hindu and sikh majority city and um uh with over 76% of the population consisting of hindus and sikhs and um um yeah and during this uh during the partition um which hit the city of rawalpindi pretty badly um this um, entire uh population had to exit the city and move towards the newly created um you know state of india and um uh, you know the city was taken over by refugees from the other side so during this uh, very drastic shift uh, the architectural and cultural uh, heritage of the city was lost um and uh, this my research is uh, sort of all about unearthing these stories and uh, bringing them to life um and that's sort of what we do under these tours also we do walking tours of pindi so we go around walking around the city um we talk about the uh, you know and we visit uh pre-partition buildings of pindi we talk about their architecture we talk about their history we talk about the people and the cultures that used to exist around these uh structures um we also uh, you know touch upon the politics of colonization and partition uh which shaped the city um as a way of uh raising awareness about the uh, you know city's heritage um i think i've uh, written uh, some points down of uh, what i want to talk about uh within this a small little presentation um um i start with walking in pindi scratching the surface uh the reason walking in pindi uh is something that i find to be so interesting um is because uh, when where anybody who's taking the walk through the city will realize uh one thing that you need to take a second look at the city before you um sort of make a judgment about it because um the city exists on many levels and uh much of what the city used to be has been concealed uh under various more structures so you need to always take a second look when you're walking through the city to be able to uh you know really uh see uh the city for what it used to be it really becomes a very inter- a, a very interesting experience where um 
since um, I mentioned the city was uh, you know, hit very badly during the partition and was a city that was uh, largely a Hindu and Sikh majority city. So most of the uh, built architecture is um, of Hindus and Sikhs. So you do see a lot of, um, you know, all over houses of Pindi, you do see a lot of um, uh, Guru Khandas and uh, you see a lot of Gurmukhi written all over the city and you see a lot of Hindi written all over the city because of which there's a very big gap between what the youth of Pindi really sees to be uh, the identity of Pindi and what the identity of the city used to be. Um, which I believe to be a very uh, deliberate effort after the partition to sort of uh, push forward the new nationalist identity of Pakistan. You also pushed forward for a, a very nationalist identity of Pindi, which is a city um, and all of a sudden, this, this city's heritage was no longer the city's heritage because it was um, the heritage of uh, another people that you no longer considered to be a part of you. Um, and um, yeah, so that's why when you're walking around the city, it really, um, and since uh, you do believe that there's been a del deliberate effort in hiding all of this history, that sort of walking around the city and experiencing all of it and talking about it and starting this conversation really becomes uh, this very interesting act uh, where um, you're not only uh, raising awareness about the city, but also um, the re redefining uh, the city and um, you know it's um, the the city and its identity, and uh, that becomes um, very interesting um, in the um, is uh, sorry that becomes very the very interesting for all of these uh, people that have uh, always felt this sort of loss between um, the between the or sort of this um, the, this conflict between this identity that you would consider to be of your own um, because um, if you go around uh, even just talking about South Asian cities if you're uh, going around um, you know uh, and seeing the city as an identity which I think uh, for the you know is a is a big part of everybody's identity and the city itself holds its own identity. Uh, you'll find it uh, find it that every almost ev um, every group of people um, putting aside class, uh, putting aside a lot of other differences, will always take pride in the city's heritage or the city's identity. But since uh, Rabal Pindi has had this uh, very sad um, uh, very sad fate where the city was the city of these other people that was taken over by refugees from the other side who no, uh, who did not associate uh, the same uh, type of feelings with the city that some uh, some other people did earlier. Um, and uh, because of that, uh, you the people have been feeling uh, this really big disconnect. And then this, uh, later on, the city uh, was, you know, the, the sister city of Islamabad, and then there was this newer city, um, which also was, uh, you know, was a city that was built for the elite. So uh, a lot of the families of Rawalpindi that were doing very uh, financially well would later on move towards Islamabad, leaving the city behind to again, uh, you know, um, be, uh, you know, no longer the holding an identity that somebody could be proud of. And even today, uh, the, the the city city of Pindi does not really um, evoke any emotions um, of uh, sort of um, pride within the people of Pindi. So the two has really become an interesting way of uh, owning the city's heritage and sort of redefining it for the younger generation. Um, and within the, the, um, the loss of uh, Rawal Pindi's identity, you'll see that um, Many times, when even if you have to travel uh, through this uh, to the city uh, from Islamabad, uh, you'll see that uh, there's very quick roads that you're supposed to take. So uh, much of what's around you and what really you know, I would define as being gravel pindi uh, gets uh, you know uh, taken away from you because you sit in a car that is a very personal space that you know, and you have sort of these walls all around you, and then you travel very fast through the city. Uh, as opposed to when you start walking around the city, you really start to experience the city for, um, the, you know, a lot of the activities that happen in the city and, you know, a lot of the things that um, are sort of hidden behind these walls um, and um, a lot of these experiences and uh, the, the local people and the local cultures that, that are existing there. Uh, besides that, um, you... Um, you really get to experience the city life for how it would have been or how 
uh, you know, it really is for all of these people that have been uh, living in the city. Um, and uh, a very similar thing, um, I think if you're looking into is uh, Islamabad versus Rawalpindi, you'll see that Islamabad was built to be uh, the opposite of what Rawalpindi is. The the city was, you know, primarily made for walking uh, because the city really developed itself during the Sikh period. Um, and then Islamabad was a city that was built for cars. And then uh, Rawalpindi the, was a city that was made uh, uh, during, the, you know, primarily built during the Sikh period. So there's a lot of Sikh architecture. Um, and Islamabad the, is a city with a lot of Islamic modern architecture. Um, so it, it becomes very easy for you to pick onto the identity of Islamabad while, uh, while you know, sort of ignoring Pindi for, um, um, you know, for the for all that is uh, it has offered uh, throughout. Um, but also uh, looking into this uh, very interesting observation that I do see with these tours is that we you do travel through this the the city of Pindi and um, lately the tours have picked on. Um, um to be very popular um within these cities so a lot of people do come by the tours were originally started as a way of you know sort of promoting rawalpindi's heritage towards rawalpindi students so that uh, there was something um for you to sort of identify with later on uh but these tours have sort of since then changed a lot uh where there's a lot of people that come to these tours with the not with the idea of just learning but also with this idea of enjoying and um it's um i i have to say that you know giving these tours i do play a part in that also in the sense that these tours are very curated at this point these tours are no longer just walking around the city at any time uh going through these very very busy and uh, crowded roads and crowded markets and you know really just stopping and talking about the city um these tours have really uh, become something that are very curated uh, that uh, you know you know what time to go to which place and you know how to sort of find your way around the around the city um, as a way of seeing the city or experiencing the city uh, for leisure purposes no longer to you know really walk, walk in the city with the idea that hey I want to learn about the city so I'm going to take this walk uh, like you know all this, the people of travel do. So um, ever since I've, I've I've been thinking about this, I've started looking at the uh, this uh, walk around Pindi, at least the walking tours around Pindi, to be uh, more of a leisure activity than uh, you know this act of resistance. Because I have been seeing that uh, uh, the, throughout this time, a lot of people have um, before me have uh, you know tried to find more about the city and sort of publish it. Uh, and sort of, you know, propagate this information all over, uh, have done incredible work. But at this time, now that the city, uh, city's tours have become uh, this activity that all of these, the, all of the diaspora that is coming from uh, Europe and uh, North America, or um, the diplomats that uh, live in, the, in Islamabad would like to, you know, see the real Pakistan and uh, come take this two hour long the walking tour around the city and then you know sort of believe it to be the real city life and you know it's very much something that i have uh sort of created an access way for a lot of the people to come and access these uh these place, uh, places in these spaces um and you know then you really come to think uh whether or not that is still um, an act of resistance um i do also see uh, especially if you're a local person um, one of the reasons that Rawalpindi's uh, local population would never get to uh, hear much about the, the much about the city or really experience uh, much uh, or sort of you know scratch the surface as I've mentioned earlier uh, to really see you know what the city used to be is because um, this uh, this point that we have come to um, where um, you know in the late capitalist stage where uh, most of the city is just too busy trying to get on with life. Uh, and you know this uh, this idea that you would really like to walk around and you know learn more about the city again. I think at the end of the day, again becomes an act of resistance. Um, and uh, yeah, learning stories about the city will you know keep the city alive. And uh, you know, as the if you're learning about it or if you're talking about it, that at the end of the day is the biggest act of resistance that you can play within Double Pindi because there is a very deliberate 
effort to uh, hide the city's identity. Thank you. So uh, we are on our last segment, which is we're going to share uh, between Shaheen, Numan, and myself. We will talk about uh, from the walking and witnessing about on Karachi. So we won't take that long and we'll jump into the public conversation. So uh, my name is Marvi Mazar and uh, my, uh, with my uh, project, there's a very important ally, which is Shaheen Numan. And uh, um, she is now guiding the tours in Karachi's old town, which is almost a four hour, four hour long walk, uh, starting from this square. Uh, when I when, when I initiated the walk and when I started developing the, the the infrastructure of it, that how are we going to curate this walk? That walk was almost about that. Just shows that as you are in the middle of the project, it's been like what now four years with us with this walk. Uh, the more we went deeper and deeper into it, and and the more familiarity we had with the area, the walk kind of started started growing, and and we started finding new ally, uh, uh, new streets, new corners, new buildings to talk about. So Pakistan uh, Chalk itself is a very important square in in the middle of this uh, area, which is a publication press area. Uh, it's also called the paper market area. And over here, the square was uh, rehabilitated by a bunch of us, um, primarily like there were like six architects uh, who helped me initiate this uh, design process. And um, after this, then a, a, a small group of people from uh, Berlin uh, came and joined us and we developed a pavilion and they were called the Zoo House. From here, we uh, started uh, thinking of how the squares make a difference or the public space makes a difference. So um, what we did was that uh, Pakistan Chowk uh, itself, the landmark, um, a couple of artists and uh, some inhabitants, inhabitants from the area uh, take it, started taking ownership of the square once it was designed. And um, the artists over there started meeting every Sunday and started painting. And uh, we took advantage of that. These are some of the before photographs of the area. And, um, and then after rehabilitation, these were some of the before and after images. Uh, what happened was that once those artists started taking me, started doing the regular meetups, we thought there's a need of uh, a, a space where cultural activity can grow. And we started doing cultural programming and started meeting every Sunday, either for uh, Mohalla Bazi, which is a neighborhood talks, or um, for um, book readings, for kawalis, for uh, performances. So this square was being used for a lot of outdoor activities, painting classes for children, um, etc. And then from here, there was some kind of like, you know, I mean, then a lot of women and a lot of young girls started showing interest on meeting here regularly that the community center was set up for those intimate conversations or for those open mics where we needed a, a, a enclosure, like we needed a space where uh, we couldn't hear a lot of like, you know, uh, city noise and where we could intimately sit together and think about what projects we would like to implement. And this is where we started doing our mapping and spoken history projects and, and other cultural activities. So, so these are some of the images from the public square that where, where these artists started meeting and, and we had like these performances and mulakat over chai, where you can see these corner meetings with the residents and, um, and, and we grew from there. And, we, and then uh, what happened was that, and everything is interconnected, right? So when we started our mapping project and our spoken history, uh, all that data collection held, uh, led us towards developing a tour. And like Pamaljeet was talking about how uh, you stumble upon one thing or the other, we also have a very similar story that we never thought of becoming, uh, you know, heritage walk experts. But it 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 was we had those maps with us, we had those stories with us where the residents had opened up their heart and told us about, you know, in, inheritance, talked about pagri system, talked about heritage, talked about architecture. And, and all of those uh, narratives were leading us towards that we would like to share that with civil society, with people to share, to create awareness. And that led me towards developing Heritage Walk Karachi. And, uh, and these, uh, these initially, I started taking these you know, people with, of course, it starts off with friends, then it starts off with word of mouth. And then the artist community started taking interest. 
Then I started collaborating with institutions, started collaborating with schools, started bringing children in. And of course, my main focus is to bring a lot of young people towards understanding the politics of heritage and preservation and conservation. Because uh, in schools and institutes, especially where I studied, our heritage was never uh, uh, spoken or never taught in a, in a manner that it is a could be turned into a mainstream practice. We were only taught to understand modern architecture or how to um, uh, develop newer structures rather than thinking about interventions, thinking about adaptive reuse, thinking about uh, rehabilitation, restoration, conservation. These all terminologies were something which came much later while walking and understanding through cities and old towns. So um, uh, Shaheen Numan was one of my, I mean, she came as, a, I, 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 in fact, I'll leave that story to her. Shaheen, would you like to share your bit? Okay. Thank you, Mavi, for the introduction. And uh, well, I'm Shaheen Numan, and I came as an explorer because when Marvi was doing the walks, and uh, I've been brought up in Karachi, so I knew quite a lot about this uh, city. But particularly where, where Marvi was doing the walks, I, I, there was a British Council the library. The first British Council library was established in one of the buildings, and I was a member of it. So I knew quite a lot about that one also. So the other building also. So, and I approached Mavi. I said, would, I would like to join you to know and to uh, show other people about this city. So that's how I joined in. And I've and never worked before. And the, the passion for the colonial buildings brought me to this thing. And uh, Mavi just had... Shine, how many uh, walks have you conducted by now? Uh, today was the 141st walk, 141. Yeah. <laughs> and it's been five years in February. I'll, I'll be completing five years. So just to start off, this is uh, uh, something, uh, I mean, I would like to give credit here that I had this lovely architect working for me, Azima West, and she uh, developed this first map of ours where she just one day got up from my office and she said, this is it. I'm going to go now and do some practical research. She started walking. And uh, she's like like a thin little character, comes back with all like soot and, and smoke and her clothes, everything was like all over the place. And she comes and she's like, I have start, I have, I know what the route is going to be like. And I said, what is it? Is it, it's, she said, it's from one Nala to the other Nala, which means from one gutter to another sewerage pipe, open line. And I said, okay, do you think that's the best place to start off? She said, yes, that's how you, you, you talk about the politics of, of infrastructural issues. So we're going to do it that way. And of course, um, uh, that walk also needed a lot of amendments and a lot of like, uh, uh, you know, through errors and through practices. We started seeing that instead of just focusing on public buildings or just focusing on large buildings, how about like going into the nexus of residences and start thinking about older structures, which are apartment buildings, thinking about uh, bazaars and thinking about um, um, uh, single stories, how, how those are playing. So scale became a very major issue and a major, major question in our work. And we constantly were looking into scale of Old Town. And that scale uh, is what led, led me towards uh, conducting this major advocacy towards uh, towards thinking about preservation of old town from scalability angle. That you know what is verticality doing and what kind of uh, uh, interventions is that making? Uh, when we talk about uh, losing heritage on daily basis, what is it doing? It is creating a, a, a space for real estate development, right? So our heritage walks talks a lot about uh, uh, losing context. Every, like our walks may maybe started from one and a half hour to now four hour long, but these these witnessing is is very critical for us, and that witnessing is is primarily talking about uh, a colonial uh, uh, minds colonial mapping. Then from there the craftsmanship, then um, the the yellow uh, stone, which was which was a local stone of Karachi, and then and then the uh, and the families who were working on the craftsmanship of it which became another critical part. So, you know, for us, the layering, the, 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 the research not only stood on, on history, it stood on, uh, on the tangible and intangible aspect of it, that who are the people living in those buildings? What relationship do they have with these, these structures? And, um, and then, you know, slowly, slowly, the, 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 the route grew, the buildings grew, uh, the numbers of the building that we started talking about, they started growing. And, and unfortunately, we don't have... Uh, the privilege of having 
lot of written history. So this is all oral history collection that we did to, to kind of extend our tours. Um, I wish we had more books and I wish our conversations can be converted into those books, you know, maybe those can help in growing into more uh, uh, guide, uh, guides in the city. And, and that's another problem that, you know, I mean, the, uh, having more guides will help us create more narratives and create more uh, uh, storytellings. Uh, and maybe those those um, help in in, in, a, in a developing an allyship. So um, so so now I'm going to talk about a very important uh, uh, um, I would say like it's it's uh, it's our duty from Heritage Walk Karachi to to flag and and to to ra raise awareness through different uh, tools and and Twitter is one of our major tools that we use. And Sunday is a special day where the city A is quiet. It is a, it's a non-working day. So the com commercial activities are, uh, you know, next to nothing apart from restaurants and so, apart from dhabas. So that is the day that we uh, do a lot of documentation. Um, before I'm going to start and talk about my advocacy and why uh, walking and witnessing, and I would, I mean, walking, witnessing, showing you Karachi, uh, different buildings would have been easier, but I would like to only stay um, uh, close to the topic of advocacy through our walks. And I'm going to share four to five case studies. And, and in here, I'm going to again request Shaheen Oman, before we, uh, before I talk about the, the uh, query or the, before the importance of advocacy, through our walks. Can you talk a little bit about the Kanji building? What happened? Uh, I was, uh, as Marvi just mentioned, we use, we walk on Sundays as it's a closed day and the public is not much there. There's less traffic and it's easy to observe the buildings. So this is a very beautiful building with beautiful stained glass on it. You can see the colors, the, stain, the red, yellow, blue glasses on it. And this was a prime example of showing the stained glass used in the, the colonial era. So while I was walking one day and I saw the rubble on this uh, street and I was really shocked to see this building being tear torn down. So I reported it to Marvi and, and through with the help of neighbors, we took some photographs and we reported it to the authorities. And we, because of our activism, you can say uh, we were able to save the building. And now it's just a freestanding facade. And... Uh, it's really very heartbreaking to show this building how it was and how it is because when you when you walk by it you can see the light filtering in and that shows that there is no roof or no ceiling to the building so this is interesting like you know there are some elements that you you get uh, to see uh, and those are like um, when i when i go back to to the first photograph you can see the building from inside is quite dark and slowly slowly the light starts filtering in and you start seeing that some activity is going inside and that is usually by weakening either the floor, the ceiling, and the light starts penetrating in. And that's our first sign to see that some activity is going on, which is not right. Uh, the, so the, the first uh, uh, sign is uh, filtering of light. And then I'll show you this really heartbreaking video, which one of the neighbors sent it to me. Is it, is it on at your end? Can you see it? So this is a typical activity, which I call it a very theatrical uh, uh, experience. And you can see that the workers, the laborers are on Sunday breaking bit by bit uh, uh, the structures. And why Sunday? Because that's the day when the department monitoring and, and uh, uh, any kind of surveillance is at its zero. So this is a good day uh, to kind of like get rid of the main uh, uh, strengthening structures like you know uh, beams and columns. And if you once get rid of that, then it's easy to kind of declare the building, uh, an, uh, you know, a dangerous structure. And once it's a dangerous structure, you can get it delisted. But here, what we did was while this video uh, is carrying on, and, and this is a neighbor. So we do a lot because, you know, we everyone started, you know, uh, the neighborhood knows we've been conducting walks and uh, Shine Auntie is a regular figure over there. So it became quite interesting that the people started becoming our allies, you know, resident next door neighbors. They started feeling the pain uh, by looking at our advocacy and our activism, as well as what we did at the square. It brought a lot of like, uh, whatever we are doing, it must be right. So sharing these videos were coming from a very heartfelt space. And here is what I, I always say that, you know, no matter how much is written about Karachi being a very uh, individual, individual city or a city where um, uh, it's a migrant city, people come and go, people don't have ownership. 
yet there is some kind of blind ownership which I find in the city. Uh, yes, people come here to come for big dreams. It's a city, it's a coastal city, it's a city of a transit, or it's a city where people migrate from smaller towns to, to come here and become something. Or, uh, but no matter there is a difference between ownership and, and conduct creating an ownership, there is, a, there is some kind of like a soft zone for the city for a lot of people. And that's what one, uh, uh, one is always endeared and wants to understand better. So as you see in this image where it says footprints Kanji building in limbo is you now you see the flaws are all gone and the, and the skin is standing on its own. And, 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 and our bylaw kind of supports that. Uh, unfortunately, it says only save the skin. You don't have to so save the internal parts of it. And that's where I had written this article, uh, uh, which was on lost glory, where building is losing their soul and only their uh, superficial skin remains. So another uh, uh, building of the same sort that we saw, it's called the Preet Kutia, Preet Kutia, Preet Kutia building. And it's in Soldier Bazaar. Shine Aunty, would you like to again share the background of it? Now, as Marvi mentioned, the neighbors have been our allies. So when this building was being demolished, I mean, it started demolishing it. People came to us. I mean, this is not in a, the area where we, we, we do our work. So this is another area. And so the people who would be living there, they just came up to us and they said, that this building, it's a beautiful building, 1934 building, it's being demolished. So do something about it. But by the time we came to know about it, it was you can see the images here, how it has been. It was all the ceiling is gone. And then by the time we came to know it, it was a flat land. So this so, is what I wanted to tell you that. It, it, and we, we tried to report it to the activities also, uh, the, uh, the concerned authorities. But the, the building is already gone now. So we, we not only the show the we can say through walking, we not only show the buildings, we try to be, be the activists also. So this is what it is like. Um, I mean, here you can see the laborers are removing the first most important things, which are the grills, the iron doors and the windows. Um, unfortunately, the city is taken over by uh, mostly by the uh, real estate developers who uh, and, and, and the building mafia, I would say, who have. Uh, no uh, relationship to these uh, structures and they think as if they are uh, nothing but a problem and this is coming through lack of grassroots active uh, through, through grassroots uh, awareness and also the mechanisms to create these heritage buildings into a meaningful or economic benefits they don't have they don't like there is no understanding that these can be created into economic benefits only if you work with it rather than working against it and and this is something which uh, uh, is a responsibility of the of the department of the government to make it as um, uh, the awareness should be as as on daily basis as anything else because an identity of an area is created through a past and that past is is on a losing factor on on everyday basis um, and our works. This is, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, where there is like 30% of very solid in, uh, structures which are worth showing through in turn. I mean, I could have shown you some really, really beautiful buildings which are intact, which are doing really well and, and people uh, stand by it uh, as, as a form of an identity factor. But then the simultaneously, these are the structures which are not your back, uh, these are not your backyards or these are not something where you, sh you, you don't see them. They're very visible. So this kind of visible violence is what we are uh, constantly uh, talking about through uh, social media and bringing in the government responsible. So we literally, I mean, here you can say that I have tagged Minister Culture and we, I'm directly uh, sharing the violence with him. And then he responds and says, uh, through, I mean, you can see this, this is like almost a very dramatic image in the center where the rubble is kind of coming out oozing as if it's almost a flood of rubble. Uh, emerging out. So another Bhatia Bhavan is another structure which we lost in 1931 building. And these were apartments. Now they're going to be a high rise here. So again, the query of like, how are responsibly are we thinking about securing Old Town, but not from a nostalgia forward? Like how can these buildings develop into infrastructure of tomorrow? And uh, um, I'm not going to take much time uh, because I know it's it's a Sunday night and I don't want to take too long. But I would like to share this another, uh, uh, you know, kind of like a really sad 
part uh, where we are losing out on our frescoes as well. And, and these are, I mean, I, what I showed you was, was very external infrastructure that we are losing, right? But inside, which I am talking constantly and our, and our bylaw is against it too, because our bylaws is saying secure only the outer layer. And don't and it's not necessary to secure the inner layer, inner inner side. But sometimes the inner side is far more important than the outside. Inside you will have diadans, you will have uh, these kind of frescoes, you'll have uh, 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 the taks, yeah, uh, yeah, the courtyards or the jarokas or the these lovely corridors which kind of connected you to the other or or the women uh, um, women the bridges for women from one household to the other household where uh, they were the, they were the uh, like a um, elevated uh, uh, um, kind of corridors for for internally family to move around rather than going downstairs or taking uh, public streets they could just maneuver around from one level to the other from one building to the other, just because there was a lot of neighborhood relationship next to each other. And, and these are the some things like, like really one uh, thinks about that, what is going to happen? What kind of restoration or preservation act does there need to be to, to secure that these things are not damaged or punctured through, uh, 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 through a, a small list, like, you know, there's a pipe going through. And how do you secure these things? Because you don't have a uh, relationship with these frescoes doesn't mean that it's not an important element. And uh, what has come out of these is by flagging them and then talking and calling them out on these public platforms is that we have kind of gotten uh, some uh, stay orders. We have gotten these government letters uh, where they have put a stay order on the on the on the floor on the um, on the properties where you cannot do anything to it. But <clears throat> these are all the letters that we have kind of like uh, won the cases or try to stop the demolition of it and and uh, no one can touch those those uh, structures but again this is also a very harsh way of government to intervene now what's next after these letters right these letters are there but what kind of protection element are they leading uh, i'm just going to stop this here and and have a discussion and then we can open it up that what what is after you know once you see these letters on these properties what's next you know, you're leaving it at a very un, like a a, a a conclusion which doesn't which didn't really solve the problem. It's still an issue. Kanji building is still standing on its own any time if any monsoon or any uh, harsh environmental degradation takes place. The first thing is that the elevation will collapse. So we have these kind of um, issues in and 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 through our walking and through our politics of uh, awareness programs. We try to uh, bring this into uh, our cities and talk to our civil society that how can one develop a better infrastructure to safeguard such heritage monuments and buildings. So thank you so much. Marvi, I'd like to add into this thing that uh, we, besides the walk, we're trying to capture or can say uh, collect pieces of uh, buildings as an evidence of past glory. And we call that as a Museum of Ruins. We're trying to uh, establish a Museum of Ruins in future for, for the people who haven't seen. I mean, ruins. that's, a, yeah. I mean, she's been picking up these, these rubbles and ruins from, from the streets and thinking of like, you know, displaying them somewhere of the past and showing people that, hey, this is what has lost. But uh, technically speaking, it would be great that one could like, you know, plug these uh, rubble pieces back onto those buildings and uh, not just on those buildings or the newer buildings that come up and you you kind of like you know insert this rubble on the entrance or maybe you know this is some kind of like a like a dream that one thinks about that these can be a way of like remembering the lost structures um so again you know since i'm i also presented and i'm also the moderator here so i'm going to switch my gears and i'm going to uh, ask uh, aksa to uh, start with the questions and josefa uh, from our uh, panelists, and uh, and I would like Yunus uh, and and Pamajit and and Hassan to uh, please engage with us to to for these questions. I mean, I'll I'll I can start with one of the questions here, with especially with when uh, Yunus and Pamajit when you were presenting and Hassan when you were presenting. I would like to know, like you know, when you are taking through these walks. Um, what kind of vision? I mean, uh, uh, Eunice, you opened up, you showed us the public buildings, you showed, I mean, we are very much familiar with our 
uh, uh, Minar building and, and the major like, you know, iconic structures. But is there a kind of like a vision that you have as a guided tour? Uh, what kind what 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 kind of map do you have in mind? Are these all like larger public buildings that you are showing? Or are you or you have some kind of perspective that, that my map will be very different from anybody else who's a guide in the city? So uh, we actually how we did. So uh, we right now we have have seven tours that we have curated and all those seven tours are like one in one tour it's focused on urban design we come uh, we walk one sector one neighborhood unit on foot and we understand what the road system the networks the different type of housing and the, how a primary school works what the size of a sector is and all and then we have some tours like a cultural center tour in which we cover museums so we right now have like a diversity in which we have three tours which are more centered toward the building point of view, like buildings, which cover major buildings. And we have four tours which cover like the urban landscape. So in that, we don't spend much time talking about buildings or visiting buildings in detail, but rather we just walk around and see how the whole context. As opposed to uh, Pindi, I think uh, there's not... Uh... You know, there's not these very large grand buildings to see because uh, the throughout history has been a very small city. So uh, when you're starting the city, one thing I do like to do is sort of go around in a circle because the city was originally built as a circular city. Um, but um, you know the the map sort of changes. Um, the most of what, the, what you want to do within the city is sort of um, you know walk around, uh, experience you know this built history um, and uh, you know. Um, much of the uh, the properties in Pindi um, would be evacuated properties. So uh, these are sort of repurposed buildings. So a temple could be, you know, a house today. So, you know, you build these sort of local relationships also. Um, and, you know, you take people into other people's houses and, you know, you really, uh, you know, see different buildings. So, um, yeah, um, it, it differs from tours, uh, tour to tour and there's not like one tour that we like to do. It all, uh, always depends on, you know, how engaging the crowd is also. Maybe, you know, the crowd is from Pindi, so they know a lot of buildings already. So, uh, you know, this tour may become longer. And, you know, I was talking about it earlier, how um, these tours have also gone towards, you know, a very, like, curated, you know, tourist-friendly tour. So, you know, those tours will be shorter and, you know, may follow a very strict guide. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you know, can always differ because you can lead from one alley to another. Um, I would also like to add a question um, for the to hear everybody's opinions on. Um, what do you guys consider heritage? Uh, because you know, we all are talking about heritage of these cities, whether you know, sort of tangible or intangible. But um, um, later on, uh, what building do you consider to be heritage? What you then versus what do you not consider to be heritage? If I can throw this out. Thanks, Hassan. Amaljeet, would you like to respond? Uh, yes, uh, this is a very interesting question because generally when we talk about heritage, so generally the buildings are dated like century back or so maybe they are built. So if you're talking today about a heritage building, quote unquote, so it generally means that it must be built in a 19th, late 20th century at least, or like early 9th, early 21st century. But on the contrast, when the whole city is not you know, from here on a very low price, the Tikabart, just a big low price, people from Switzerland and France, they came and bought all this and restored and sold. At that time in India, so there was a rule that Jo bhi cheez saw saal purani hai, to musta export nahi kar sakte. So you can't export, so that becomes like a, a heritage or an ancient piece. You can't export anything which is 100 years old. But then when the whole, this Chandigarh furniture was getting sold, then a group of architects protested and they brought that line to 50 years. So now if it's something is 50 years old, a piece of art or a furniture, so you can't export it. So what a heritage is, it's there are many tangents to it. So it's not just only the time that you can put in. And then again, it's like some things are tangible and then some things are like intangible, a lot of uh, emotional value to it or a, a lot of social value to it. Exactly, because uh, one thing that I've been seeing with all of these, um, since these cities have spread out so much, would you consider the place that you're living in today to be heritage 70 years later? Because, you know, uh, 
but uh, with with that thought in mind, I come to think of the type of impact that these buildings are having on these the, the humans around them. Most of these uh, uh, the in these larger towns, most of these built structures are of personal use of a singular family. So these singular family units do not provide any sort of uh, engagement for the community, and later on. Uh, will be forgotten or will not be considered heritage just because of the fact that they uh, sort of put forward no uh, influence or um, the, no effort to bring the communities together. You see, I mean, heritage, I mean, the, these are the kind of talks we need to have more often, uh, something that we don't do in, in, in our part of our cities or in especially in Pakistan. We haven't really dissected and understood what heritage really means. It's been quite like understood through inherited policies but today it's a, it's a time now that we need to start thinking about heritage uh, from a very uh, standalone experiences like today i mean if you guys are doing these walks what are your uh, experiences and your observations that should be part of the policies right now to talk about that these things these notions are changing and that's why one of the reasons we developed this webinar if you go back and look at our one of our recordings on nasik trails they talk about uh, uh, this this element of what really heritage means and that uh, she really uh, beautifully explains that usually heritage always is spoken by the urban planners and the heritage, but never by the residents. And I think it is a very uh, high time now to, to, to understand heritage from the people who are living in those buildings, to understand that what are their living, lived experiences, uh, which may lead us to understand and empathize with the infrastructure of its, you know, on, 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 the, on what has happened to it in today's time. So because we have been looking at it from a very top-down lens, maybe this is now the time to, in South Asia, to, uh, to think about heritage from a very everyday experience-wise. Um, yeah, I'm going to just read out the something here. So uh, sorry, I'm taking away from you, but I think we, let's have some audience in, in, uh, involved in. Okay, um, Mariam Faruqi has written that there are many large heritage sites, particularly forts, where um, encroachments have been going on for decades. And now entire towns exist within right next to the sites. It doesn't make sense to displace entire communities at this point in the name of saving heritage, even if the government had the means of motivation to resettle them. I'm interested in hearing from the panel of what they think is the best way forward in such situations something that has a positive sustainable impact on both the communities as well as the built heritage. <clears throat> I mean, I can uh, start off from the perspective of uh, Empress Market uh, as a uh, large site of, it's a contested site, which was uh, through the mechanism of encroachment, a lot of uh, economy was removed. And uh, that was just because, you know, they, from their perspective, the safeguarding of heritage building made more sense to remove anything that was attached to it. And that uh, entire case study is worth understanding as a starting point. What, uh, what does that heritage mean? I mean, if, if that's the kind of violence is gonna take place from, from the government where they will remove and, and displace the people around, then, then what's the point of saving a heritage? Who would want to enjoy a dead building, right? So that's that's like primarily what Mariam Faruqi is is mentioning, but yeah, I mean, I absolutely, I'm, you're right about it. What is the sustainable way of working with uh, with infrastructure around it, and that where that's where Arif Hassan talks about a lot of like organizing methods. You organize uh, infrastructure around it. You work with 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 systems around it. So so again, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, anybody uh -huh. else would like to yeah. About the fourth part, I think I can definitely interject and, you know, uh, tell you, because this is exactly what happened in Hyderabad, where, you know, the larger question now is whether should we remove these people from settlements inside the fort or should we, like, uh, you know, like, uh, people have built houses. It's It's been legitimized by the government, you know, by giving them a light connection or a water connection and things like that, right? So even the bigger question comes now, now that the municipality has accepted these houses as, you know, for whatever reason, for, for the, whether it is political or could be like, how are you? Are you like, there? It's a very valid question. Are you going to tell these people to move out of the house? Because there are projects in India where people have encroached upon historical sites and they've been relocated, right? But then in certain spaces like the Golconda, Food and Hyderabad, it becomes a bigger problem where these people also don't want to move because these are not like some smaller, uh, you know, it's, it's not like a, these are like legit 
houses huge houses built inside forts inside the empty spaces within the fort right so the argument also comes kar yahan par to kuch nahi hai na why can't we build a house that is i think where the government should have interjected when something happened say you know ke ke and made very clear that this is not allowed you are not supposed to do this and it would have probably set precedent but now that it is not we have lost a lot of things and today it does not make sense to remove them i would say that for sure because now it's a very it's like literally relocating an entire city i mean if you know what i mean right it's like a massive 6 6 and a half 6 kilometer uh, circumference uske andar ghar hai now there are schools colleges people live there and like there's like a whole community built around it now i think the logical answer to that would be yeah we can't relocate them but what we can do is we can save whatever is left we can maybe turn turn that turn that into a tourist location in the sense that people coexist with that so that they also aid the entire uh, leftover heritage that is there instead of simply till till you know make instead of making it in making it an issue between us versus heritage you know i think people need to be uh, made aware ke dekho bhai ye 400 so 500 so saal purana imarat hai yahan par we need to do it's important for a very specific reason that you can't like there are actually homes built on the boundary walls of the golconda fort there are homes built near the moat area where there is water going and people have connected the sewage to it and things like that right it's a much larger issue in general which i think the government the municipality people all of them the local politicians involved everybody has to get into the picture and do something about it and more often than not nobody wants to do it because it's a very long process like people have to like uh really get into it, it goes into urban planning it goes into our conservation it goes into what or how much are people willing to even you know uh put an effort into like there are certain projects which have actually restored a lot of monuments keeping all of this in mind but something like a golconda fort i think the best solution to this in this case would be to just save what we have you know turn and i think one of the easiest things to do would be to turn those things into better tourist sites like for example the part of the forts that we go to are completely uh, you know it's it complete disrepair nobody goes there some of it has been some of, some parts of it are actually used for people to drink in the night and stuff like that right so people actually can't go there it's only when you know the locals or it's only when you know the path it's only when you know the locals that you know that subah subah ja sakte kyunki subah subah koi nahi hota wahan par sham mein gaye to most likely you will find people you know drinking or doing whatever like i mean right. i think we get the idea right yeah i i don't think it's it makes sense to relocate someone unless a monument is an impending danger of collapse like you know the the monument that you've shown there are right. old buildings that people have people still live in hyderabad where it might collapse at any moment so in those situations i think then you the larger question is should we relocate them give them tell them that you can't stay here but i think where damage has been done there's no point of throwing people out because not only will it create more animosity it will also become a bigger thing oh look I mean, like the government has turned into like some monster throwing out people out of their homes some something like that the moment you get a bill right that's it like it's legitimate by the, by the municipality this is my understanding as a journalist also ke ek bar bill aa gaya bas that's it thanks you guys mm-hmm. i'm going to take so uh, uh, yeah sorry um just a small point uh, heritage doesn't exactly need to be uh, preserved into you know these white washed museums where you go and check something uh maybe the history or the heritage of these places has uh, you know over these like 70 years after the partition where all of these buildings have been encroached uh maybe this is the newer uh, you know version of it so you know experience it with whatever it comes with yeah absolutely um yeah i mean that's what they've been talking about like lived heritage is what you have to be with it like whatever you have you you work around it and uh, we're going to take a last question here because i know it's like late at your end um can the heritage i mean we have two more questions I and mean, i'm, I'm going to be we can take it as a whole can the heritage too keep changing with time today's present will be heritage tomorrow um maybe uh, pamjeet you would like to expand on that so you know, i completely agree actually on this like uh, so the heritage is not just uh, even in the terms of buildings and all as we were talking earlier about tangible and intangible heritage so the thing uh, so whatever the practices we are having today whatever the rituals we are having today so eventually the with the trying to pace of life the things are happening and so there will be a time when we look back and we say oh that that's the way people used to live and then there will be a group of people like us who are talking about the, like in 2020 20 people were living like that so 
I think it's a ever evolving loop. So. Yeah, I mean, Hyderabad in our part of our, uh, in Pakistan, Hyderabad in Sindh has the same uh, thing that Shaheen has mentioned here, that old Kila, the old fort has uh, occupied by residents and, and they are living there as, and for them, it's like a, <clears throat> like an envelope. And within that, there's a whole world, uh, city within city. So, so those are the things that one needs to kind of like adapt and, and think, rethink that, you know, maybe within that, how heritage can be highlighted. And, and then maybe the people who are living there become the, the, the caretakers, because that the, that's another question that Mariam, which goes to you, is uh, the sustainability factor. You know, you can be having whitewashed, herit uh, a lot of heritage monuments around, but what is the point if there are no protection elements? And that only comes through when people are, they kind of form an uh, uh, ownership around it. So that's another thing that, you know, in South Asia, we, we kind of face the vandalism of heritage on daily basis. And that can be through graffiti art, through anything that one, I mean, that's also itself is a query, right? Okay, graffiti art is one way of like uh, conversing and you, you're, you're talking to the city through that uh, language. But then how, how does that uh, kind of combine with your heritage preservation plan? So those, those questions and those things only come when you keep on uh, working with the society and with the community. Um, I, I mean, is there any other question that would people would like to ask? You're most welcome to kind of like, you know, open your audio and ask the question. If we have a minute, I have something else to talk about. So, so it's not only the buildings, like, uh, I just want to share a screen and show you a tree. So like Chandigarh has one of the most nicely done landscaping landscape. It's like a whole city is being landscaped and done. You can't imagine Chandigarh without trees. But recently what's happening is a lot of trees are getting cut due to various reasons. Uh, so you can, I'll just show you. So this is, this was an old mango tree in a, it's in a cultural uh, community center. So like a Janjkar where like weddings and all takes place. So this tree was, is older than the building. The whole design of a building is such that this is in the central courtyard. And sadly, uh, it has been like this. Oh. So, and, uh, so, so it's a very political. The, the, yeah, I mean, we, we also in Karachi, you know, if underpass needs to be made or overpass needs to be made, the first thing is that, you know, you get rid of like all the shaded mm -hmm. uh, colonnades. And those were like, you know, I mean, we try to preserve them as much as we can. One of our projects that we did was on banyan trees. And we preserved a line of like 64, 64 trees of those. Uh, when the, one of our malls were being constructed, we lost a lot of those, those trees. And then whatever we were remained, we kind of like preserved them and kind of, you know, made a, a quick a bill, which Yunus was talking about. And that's what we mm -hmm. did. We created a bill around it and we called it the heritage uh, uh, zone of the banyan trees, you know, something like that. And, and now it's like on their radar that they can't touch banyan trees anymore. But that one should do with entirely ecological heritage sites and landscapes. So on that note, I would like to thank everyone for taking our time and being part of this webinar. We really, really appreciate your time and your uh, coming and being uh, and discussing with us what heritage really means.